Good morning. We start with general questions, and question number one from Ash Denham. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions it has had with the UK Government regarding reports of potential asset stripping with the Edinburgh-based Green Investment Bank when it's transferred to the private sector. Cabinet Secretary Keith Brown. Hey, the Scottish Government has made repeated representations, including yesterday and today, uh, as it happens, to the UK Government since 2015 about the strategic importance of the green purpose of the bank, as well as the significance of the attention of the Edinburgh headquarters and, of course, the related jobs. I Ashton. thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer, and I welcome the action of the Scottish Government in relaying concerns about this, which I'm sure are shared by many members across this chamber. It is disappointing that the Tory Government has not continued to help the Green Bank flourish, but as an Edinburgh MSP, my concern is for the 55 jobs that are based in the city, um, has the UK Government given any assurance that they will be protected? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I share the same concerns as Ash Denham in relation both to the jobs and also to the green purpose of the bank. I have received some partial reassurances from the UK Government in the phone conversation I had yesterday that the strategic importance of the bank itself to Scotland will be fully considered mm. as part of ongoing discussions around its privatisation. I spoke to the UK Government's Minister of State for Climate Change and Industry, and during that conversation I also pressed for greater transparency around the privatisation process, as well as confirmation that the bank will continue to be headquartered in Edinburgh, along with the 55 jobs which I mentioned. I should say, it seems passing strange that uh, virtually every newspaper in the country has mentioned who the preferred bidder for the bank is, and yet yesterday in that conversation, the Minister wouldn't confirm, even at this stage, when everyone else in the world seems to know who the preferred bidder is, who the preferred bidder was. It is my belief, as I'm sure it is for Ash Denham, that headquartering the bank in Scotland is extremely important. There was a campaign to make sure that happened, which succeeded. And it's important not only because we have the pool of expertise needed to support that function, but also because it's symbolic of Scotland's role as a leader within the green energy sector, which in, in turn helps sustain and support the Scottish Government's reputation, not least in relation to the award for circular economy that we've had and also previous awards in terms of climate change. Extremely important to Scotland and we will continue to make representations. Daniel Johnson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, Ash Denham is right to highlight the impact or potential impact on jobs, including uh, many of my constituents uh, in, in Edinburgh Southern. What assurances and indeed what role uh, does the Minister think the Scottish Government can play in terms of engagement with potential uh, 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 purchasers of the Green Investment Bank? And has it had any guarantees from the, the UK Government to that effect? Cabinet Secretary. As I say, the assurances have been somewhat partial, um, and that's true in terms of the jobs, and it's true in terms of the headquarters function, and it's true in terms of the green purpose of the bank, each of which are issues on which we've pressed the UK government. You make a, a very good point about what discussions we could have with um, preferred bidders. I think we're now at the stage of a preferred bidder rather than a series of bidders. And of course, we will do what we can, and we are doing what we can, but it would be much easier if the UK government could at least confirm who the preferred bidder was. It's very difficult in that circumstance to make sure we can have those discussions, but we're not being passive on this. I should be able to see more on this and more becomes clear over the course of time. But just to assure the member, uh, as uh, like Ash Denham, an Edinburgh a member with a, a, an interest in this, that the issue of the jobs, um, and we are not just pressing for the jobs which are currently there, the 55 jobs, to be the limit. We're pressing very hard in a number of different forums to make sure that's increased, and there is a possibility that will happen. But, of course, we want to have those as high-quality, headquarter-type jobs, and also we want to ensure that the green purpose of the bank uh, is maintained. And the other issue which I press very hard on is that we're not about to see asset stripping by a private takeover. So those issues are being pressed, and if the member wants to discuss that further, I'm more than happy to do that. Question number two, Richard Lockhead. Can I ask what progress has been made in providing the Crown Estate with a social remit as part of the devolution arrangements? Cabinet Secretary Rosanna Cunningham. Um, control over the management and resources of the Crown Estate in Scotland should rest with the people of Scotland. We're currently undertaking a public consultation uh, just launched on the 4th of January to help shape the long-term arrangements for management of Crown Estate assets in Scotland. That consultation contains uh, proposals and options on how Crown Estate assets in Scotland can be managed differently in future, including the overall aims of the estate and opportunities for further devolution. Richard Lockett. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her answer, and I'm sure she'll agree that the hard-won devolution that allows Parliament to provide a social and economic remit to the Crown Estate will help 
the likes of tenant farmers in Glenlivet and Fockabers, or communities such as Tom and Tyler, Port Gordon, and my own constituency, but of course communities elsewhere in Scotland as well, to have much more say over their own future. Will the Cabinet Secretary ensure our officials keep these communities up to date as the months go by through the consultation process and beyond? Can I also ask, in terms of the surplus normally generated by the Crown Estate, which previously, of course, would have gone to the UK Treasury, are there any prospects of that being retained by the Crown Estate to reinvest into those communities? Um, well, my officials and uh, myself have uh, met with stakeholders, including representatives of uh, the rural estates, and we are happy to meet with uh, any community representatives that uh, wish to speak to us about this. So anybody with an in interest in the transfer uh, should approach officials in the first place uh, in respect of a meeting. With regard to the uh, surplus for investment, the uh, Scotland Act 2016 requires the estate to be managed as an estate in land or as estates in land managed separately, which would require primary legislation. So we need to maintain uh, the estate. There's provision for ongoing investment during each financial year for that purpose. The consultation outlines uh, intention to continue funding maintenance and investment costs in the longer term, uh, and that would include management uh, of liabilities from gross revenue or the capital budget. Um, we've committed to provide councils with the net revenue from marine assets out to 12 nautical miles. We're making provision for the interim body to retain a portion of revenue for investment in the estate. And there is discretion for Scottish ministers to vary the proportion retained, and we will keep this under review. Claudia Beamish. Thank you, presiding officer. I was very interested in the answer from the cabinet secretary to Richard Lockhead's question. And uh, it's an interest that I've had through the last session of the Parliament in the RACI committee about the redefinition of remit in relation to both social inclusion and sustainable development. And not only the remit, but also the mission statement of the Crown Estate. So while it's reassuring that Cabinet Secretary stresses that the consultation has been um, initiated, could she give further reassurance that this will be very widely publicised so that marine um, harbour groups and coastal communities and indeed tenant farmers, as, as highlighted by Richard Lockhead, uh, will have the best opportunity of inclusion in taking it forward so we have a, a really inclusive Crown Estates for the future. Cabinet Secretary. Um, yeah, yes, I can uh, reassure Claudia Beamish of, of that. It's important that all communities with an interest in any uh, aspect of Crown Estate workings uh, have a look at the consultation and consider whether or not they can uh, contribute. There is sometimes a tendency to presume that it's really only local councils and or uh, um, some of the bigger estates that might have an interest, when in actual fact, uh, relatively small bodies and organisations will be very key to this. And we do want to hear the widest possible range of views on this. Um, so work is ongoing to ensure uh, that we get out and about, that we make sure that uh, communities understand that they too can play a role in this. And I would ask members in the chamber to ensure that in the, those constituencies where there are Crown Estate interests, that they uh, in, in themselves uh, generate as much interest as they possibly can. Question number three, Annie Wells. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on how it's tackling youth unemployment. Minister Jimmy Hepburn. In December, I published the second developing in the Young Workforce Programme annual report, which highlighted the progress we're making towards the programme's headline target of reducing 2014 levels of youth unemployment by 40% by 2021. The report highlighted developments in growing vocational provision for young people in their senior phase, including growth in a modern apprenticeship programme, a significant expansion of foundation apprenticeships, establishing 17 of the 21 planned developing Young Workforce regional groups, and investing in the earlier introduction of careers advice, refocusing activity across our youth employment programmes on young people who need the most support. Annie Wells. Thank you. The Scottish Government's own progress report into its national drive to tackle youth employment revealed recently that the number of jobless youngsters increased over the past year by 2.4% to 42,000. And last month, the Scottish Government missed a great opportunity for young people in the job market after it failed to ring fence the £221 million in apprenticeship levy funds. How can we ensure that young people are given opportunities in skilled training and this, month, and this move will not discourage businesses from relocating apprenticeships elsewhere? Well, well, what Annie Wells fails to mention, of course, President Officer, is that right now Scotland continues to outperform the UK on youth employment, unemployment and inactivity rates. And indeed, 
She also failed to mention that Scotland's youth unemployment is the, at the lowest rate since the series of Garingo's statistics began, and indeed is the second lowest youth unemployment rate in the European Union. I have to say I'm surprised to hear the Conservatives once again raising the issue of their apprenticeship levy. Let's never forget that it was the UK Government that introduced the apprenticeship levy without prior notification or consultation with this Scottish Government. Of course, that £221 million is not new funding for the Scottish Government to be able to spend. It replaces existing funding. And indeed, when you take account of the £73 million cost to the public sector, it presents offset it reduces the Scottish Government's spending leeway by some £30 million. But we are investing a significant resource through our draft budget in supporting young people into employment. We've got £81.5 million to increase modern apprenticeships, £11.5 million to expand graduate level and foundation apprenticeships, £9.3 million to support employers to recruit young people who face barriers to employment, a new flexible work workforce development uh, fund of £10 million, £3.9 million to support individual learning accounts, an increase of £16.4 million in Workforce Plus budget to support delivery of a devolved employability service from April 2017 and other uh, funding support young people into employment, which is why I'm sure once they properly assess the budget, Annie Wells and the Conservatives will have to support its passage yeah. through Parliament. Question number four, Mark Griffin. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government when the Joint Ministerial Working Group on Welfare will next meet and what will be discussed. Cabinet Secretary Angela Constance. President Officer, the next Joint Ministerial Working Group on Welfare is scheduled to take place on Monday, the 20th of February. The agenda for that meeting is still to be uh, finalised. Mark Griffin. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. The Scottish Government has announced a welcome consultation on using flexibilities within universal credit to make more frequent payments. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary what discussions there have been at the Joint Ministerial Working Group around split payments? and why the Government are not also progressing with a consultation on this issue at the same time, which could pre prevent a situation where the social security system forces a woman experiencing domestic abuse to be financially dependent on that abusive partner. Secretary. Officer, let me assure Mr Griffin that we are looking at the issue of split payments very, very closely indeed. And in fact, there is some uh, intensive work and discussion going on between Scottish Government officials uh, and indeed uh, DWP officials. Uh, and we are also uh, taking the time uh, to look at all the, the consultation responses, over 500 consultation responses uh, on the way ahead for Social Security. And of course, as part of that consultation, this this was one of uh, the, the, the issues that people were pressing home hard uh, to the Scottish Government. So we are looking at the issue uh, very closely. Um, we have to uh, find ways uh, to enact political will. We have to find a delivery uh, mechanisms and we'll be keeping both Parliament and Committee uh, fully informed as we proceed. Question number five, Andy Whitewin. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will take action to regulate growth in short-term letting of residential property. Minister Kevin Stewart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Scottish Government has no plans to regulate the growth in short-term letting. However, we recognise that some concerns exist and welcome the opportunity to engage further with stakeholders on this matter. Our Private Housing Tenancy Act will come into force later this year. It will provide security, stability and predictability for tenants through measures that include a new modern tenancy, rent increases only being possible once in 12 months, and tenants having three months' notice of changes to enable them to budget accordingly. In addition, councils will have the power to apply to ministers for a cap on rent increases in their area for up to five years, and there will be a broadening of access to dispute resolution through the Housing Property Chamber of the First Tier Tribunal. Andy Whiteman. Can I thank the Minister for his answer? Over the past few weeks, I've been speaking <coughs> to constituents who live in the Old Town and Grass Market in Edinburgh. It's clear that there's a substantial problem with the unregulated growth in short-term holiday lets. We're looking at a situation where the residential population in these areas may substantially disappear within the next decade. One constituent has had very audible sex parties taking place in the flat above him. An elderly couple are now living out the rest of their years lonely in a tenement stair that's lost all of its permanent residents. Others are living with young families in a state of stress and anxiety 
due to the rent-seeking behaviour of a growing number of property owners. Does the Minister agree that the use of residential property requires a tighter regulatory framework? And in particular, does he agree that the planning system and specifically use class orders could play a significant role in ensuring that communities and councils have the tools they need to regulate the residential character, not only of the city of Edinburgh, but of many villages and rural areas across Scotland? Minister. Um, I, I sympathise with some of the stories that uh, Andy Whiteman uh, has given us there, but the planning system itself uh, cannot always readily distinguish between different types of housing tenure. Uh, where a householder proposes to change the use uh, of an existing residential flat, the requirement for planning permission will depend on the circumstances of each individual case, and it will be a matter for the planning authority concerned in the first instance. Um, I would suggest that um, Mr Whiteman may want to engage uh, in the current planning consultation uh, and urge uh, the, the residents that he have, has spoken to to do so also. Question number six, Douglas Ross. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it is content with the way that it records crime. Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson. Yes, uh, the Scottish Government records crime using the Scottish Crime and Justice Survey and Police Recorded Crime Statistics. Both measures tell a similar story of falling crime levels. The production of our police recorded crime statistics is carried out by independent statisticians and overseen by the Scottish Crime Recording Board, which ensures the data is transparent and trustworthy and, trustworthy and produced in line with the code of practice for official statistics. The success of this approach was confirmed just last year when the UK Statistics Authority designated our recorded crime data as national statistics, sending their congratulations to the Scottish Government on the leading approach being taken by our statisticians to improve the value of this information and user understanding of it. This contrasts with the position in England and Wales, where the UK Statistics Authority will not assess their statistics until there is improvements in police recording practice. Douglas Ross. But what we actually have is a Scottish Government that issues press releases with misleading figures for crimes of violence when the true figure is much higher. The Cabinet Secretary will know that the Office of National Statistics in England and Wales makes no distinction between the different levels of violence in its figures. Why does the Cabinet Secretary not agree with Derek Penman of HMICS that, and I quote, it's important crime is classified correctly so data published provides the public with an accurate picture of violent crime? Secretary. Well, the member uh, may not be aware, but the classification of recorded crime and offences in Scotland has been exactly the same since the 1920s. So the process which has been used by this administration is the same process that has been used by every administration since the 1920s, something clearly which the member had absolutely no idea on. But I can also say in regard to HMICS's recommendation looking at some aspects of these statistics. That's a piece of work which has already been taken forward by the Scottish uh, Crime Reporting Board. And that work is ongoing and will be considered in the coming uh, weeks. But despite the efforts of the member to try and undermine our statistics here in Scotland, they are the only statistics of this nature which have that national classification because of the excellent standards which we apply. Mark Ruskell. Thank you. The Cabinet Secretary may be aware that the annual wildlife crime report came under scrutiny recently in the Parliament's Environment Committee. It was revealed that a number of bird of prey persecution incidents from two years ago were withheld from the report, despite details being in the public domain from other sources. Will the Cabinet Secretary undertake to investigate why this data was withheld and what Police Scotland can do to make sure that wildlife crime reporting is transparent, accurate and has the confidence of the public? Cabinet Secretary. Well, the classification and the way in which issues are uh, recorded within these statistics is actually taken forward by statisticians and it must comply with the code of practice that is applied to uh, the recording of uh, crime statistics. I've got no doubt that as we move forward with uh, some of the changes that could take place if the Scottish Crime Recording Board believe that there is a need for any alteration to them, that that's an issue which they can give consideration to. But what I will do is I will ensure uh, that a member receives a full and detailed response to the very specific nature of the wildlife crime to ensure that he has a detailed response to that matter. 